Welcome to the BS and Beer Show. BS stands for Building Science, of course. Tonight's topic is how to build a pretty good house, uh, specifically in different climate, different climate zones. Uh, my name is Mike Maines. I'm a residential designer and passive house consultant in Maine. And tonight I am drinking a uh, ginger ale with homemade rhubarb syrup. It's very tasty. Um, uh, at, at the BS and Beer Show, we encourage local groups. This is a fun, fun na uh, nationwide thing, but it started as a local discussion group, and local discussion groups are really a great way to share local building science knowledge. Uh, feel free to use the name BS and Beer or any variation. Um, I would like to thank uh, our guests for coming tonight and, uh, and Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building Magazine for being our media sponsors. Um, and I will turn it over to Brian. Hey everyone, I am Brian Pontalillo. I'm the editor of uh, Green Building Advisor and I've worked at Fine Home Building Magazine for a long time. Um, and coincidentally, I had to, I'm having some internet problems. So right before um, we, I, we started tonight, I quickly moved um, my location to be closer, closer to the modem. Hopefully that will keep, um, keep things at bay. And now I'm sitting at these shelves right behind me. And, and these shelves, when I installed these shelves, we were moving into this place and, and they're, they are barely hanging up there with a, with a couple of drywall screws. And I thought, how pitiful would it be if an editor from Fine Home Building Magazine's shelves crashed to the, to the uh, floor while, while doing the BS and Beer show? Um, well, anyway. The, contact, the contractors in the audience would all sympathize. <laughs> I understand. Um, I, have, uh, I have the... Uh, the duty of some housekeeping on the on the BS and Beer show. So um, just so um, to fill you in on how tonight's program will go, we'll, we'll have a little bit of introductory time, um, after which Mike will uh, give a presentation tonight, a short presentation on the Pretty Good House and, and what it's all about to sort of set a baseline for everyone. And then from there, we're going to move into a conversation with a couple of uh, three, actually, uh, more panelists tonight um, who, are, who are proponents of the Pretty good house, if not uh, pioneers of the, the pretty good house <laughs> ideal. Um, and so we'll take questions from anyone who wants to ask them and we'll take them through the chat box. So um, open up the chat box, which you do by uh, hovering your cursor over the bottom of your um, Zoom screen and, and just clicking on the chat icon so that your chat box pops up. Make sure that in the drop down menu, you select all panelists and attendees. Um, so that we all see uh, the conversation and the questions. And um, I think that's about all I have to say tonight for the, for the housekeeping duties. And I do want to, um, I do want to turn for a moment to, to something um, a, a little bit more serious. And I hope that, um, I hope that you can, can all bear with me for a moment if I fumble through this. Um, a, a couple of months ago, I picked up my son in Chicago when his uh, college dorm closed because of the coronavirus pandemic. And we drove home from Chicago to South Carolina. And I remember in the ride, and this was, this was before we knew how serious the pandemic would get. We didn't know where things were going. And I remember saying to him, this could, this could be one of the most significant events of our lifetime. And for the last couple of months, as we've all been at home, I felt fortunate, really fortunate, grateful to have a job. And I've really found solace in, in my work. And, and there's some, been some silver linings and this, this show is one of them. Um, but I have to say this, this week, I haven't been able to work at all. I'm barely getting through my days um, and, and getting my, my job done. And, um, and I didn't think it would be right to start tonight's show without some sort of recognition um, of what's happening right now in our country as we are facing, finally, hopefully, all are facing what is, what I, I believe is the most important, the most painful, and the most unresolved issue in our history. And so I don't, I don't have any wisdom. I'm not the I'm not the right person to be speaking right now. So uh, maybe just if you would all join for just a, a minute in a, of a moment of silence. Okay, thank you, everyone. I will pass it over to Emily. Uh, thank you for, for taking the time and, and you know helping us there in the BS and Beer Show start, start off tonight. 
As a not great follow up, my dog has decided now will be a great time to bark at the chipmunk in the yard. Uh, so, uh, Emily Montrum, if you're new to the Beer Show, um, you can sign up for our email newsletter over at thebsnbeershow.com. That tells you uh, what the next upcoming uh, guest is and sends as to uh, joining the link for the show too. If, if you don't have it, that's a great way to, to add it to your calendar. Um, video recording for tonight's show will be up on uh, Green Building Advir Advisors Building Science blog after the show. It's usually up on Friday or Monday at the latest, depending on how quickly uh, we get to it. And um, we want to encourage everybody to continue the discussion from tonight's panelists on the Green Building Advisor uh, blog, especially Pretty Good House. Uh, we tend to comment on all kinds of things. So if you have more questions that don't get answered from the chat box, um, please feel free to continue the conversation uh, over there after the show. Um, and I failed to mention that tonight I am drinking a Voodoo IPA from a nice little local brewery by my in-laws called Side by Each. So uh, I like a, a good American IPA, so having some Side by Each tonight. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing uh, the guests on the show tonight. So I'm going to start with Dan, uh, who we all know is the godfather of Pretty Good House. Um, Dan has worked as a carpenter and a contractor in Portland, Maine for three decades. He focuses on energy efficiency and healthy new homes and renovations. He's written for the Journal of Light Construction, Green Building Advisor, Fine Home Building, and for the past decade has been the moderator for one of our local building science discussion groups. Um, I actually met Dan back in 07, 08, when he was building a lead for existing buildings project with an architect I worked for at the time. So when he says he's been doing building science, he's, you know, no joke. So Allison Bales, uh, I had the pleasure of doing a podcast with Allison recently. Um, he founded and runs Energy Vanguard, um, a small firm that does residential HVAC design, building science, consulting, training, and quality assurance. He also writes for Energy Vanguard's blog, which gets millions of views each year. He has a PhD in physics from the University of Florida and a strong background in the science underlying the growing field of building science. And if you didn't know, Allison is currently working on his first book, A House Needs to Breathe, or Does It? <laughs> uh, and if you're like me, you've read so much by Allison over the years that you were fairly certain that this was not his first book. <laughs> so... <laughs> And we have Jeff Adams. Uh, we want to make sure that we extend pretty good house to all parts of the country. So having Allison and Jeff on and not just being a uh, super New England focus is a pleasure. He currently works as an architect for Atmosphere Design Build, an emerging design build firm in Grass Valley, California. They specialize in custom design handcrafted homes with a focus on superior energy performance. Jeff received a broad education first at Princeton and then at UCLA. Uh, he took a break from practicing architecture and worked on a number of community projects, including the development of a permaculture-based community center. In 2015, he decided he wanted to jump back into the world of architecture. I don't know why, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> and has been working with Atmosphere Design Build ever since. Uh, he is not only an architect, but a husband, a father, and in his spare time, he likes to cook, grow things in his garden, uh, do things with the community, and hike in the woods. So thank you all for being on tonight. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the PGH scribe, Mike Mains, who's going to kick us off with his presentation tonight. Yeah. Um, thank you, Emily. Um, yeah, let me, uh, Dan is the godfather of Pretty Good House, and he named me the, uh, the official scribe some years ago. So I'm going to uh, attempt to share my screen and just do a uh, short overview here. Um, let's see, I think that is not the right screen. <laughs> Actually, I think that was the right screen. Sorry, like <laughs> I said, technology, not my thing. Uh,
All right, can you see the Pretty Good House logo? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay, good, thank you. It's, Zoom is a little weird. You're flying, kind of flying blind to some degree. <laughs> Um, yeah, so this is our new Pretty Good House logo. Um, and come on. so here is a brief history of the Pretty Good House. Uh, as of last year, uh, thanks to Bob Swinburne, we have a, a uh, fledgling website, prettygoodhouse.org or prettygoodhouse.com. We hope to uh, fill that out over time. Um, I say we because I've been involved almost from the start. Um, a little over 10 years ago, Dan um, started moderating or put, you know, put, put together with Steve Constantino a uh, building science discussion group at Performance Building Supply in Portland, Maine. Um, it was just a few of us building nerds getting together and chatting. Um, I wasn't there on the first one, but I maybe Dan invited me maybe by the third one or so I started going. It was just a few of us hanging out in Steve's warehouse and uh, Dan would bring up a topic and we'd write stuff on the board. Um, and I, I had never experienced anything else like that. I don't think there were other groups like that um, at the time. Um, after a couple of years, we had a good time, um, but uh, Dan had, had uh, came in one night with an idea that um, he had been frustrated with some of the, uh, some of the standard based projects he'd been working on, you know, trying to get LEED certification or considering Passive House, um, especially back then it was hard to get, um, uh, get, get, get client buy-in, you know, just the, 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 there were, 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 were downsides. So Dan just said, just what, what um, I, I, I just want to build a pretty good house. What, what would that look like? Um, well, why do we need a standard? That there are there are already some standards. There are building codes, you know, d different codes across the country, but a lot of them are based on the International Residential Code. Um, it's a good solid base for the worst house you can legally build. Um, they're, they're, they're not useless. A lot of smart people have put a lot of time and effort into determining what is what is the minimum, what are the minimum acceptable standards for life, safety, occupant health, and then uh, some token environmental considerations. Um, as well. Um, if you want to do better than code, uh, f uh, the LEED program from the uh, U.S. Green Building Council has been around quite a while. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly holistic approach um, that involves a lot of check boxes and the complaint is it's kind of expensive to administer and it, involve, it can involve gaming the system. Um, Passive House has been around for a while. A lot of us are, are fans. Um, they make a lot of sense for densely populated areas, for multifamilies, commercial buildings. When you're building one-off residential houses, they can make sense, but they can be a little bit uh, hard. They, they can be quite hard to reach. Um, and clients, if they don't come in wanting a passive house, it's hard to convince somebody to do a passive house. Um, if you kind of combine lead and passive house, you get the living building challenge. It, makes everything super hard to reach. It's a great standard. It's really driving the bleeding edge right now. Um, our friends, uh, Bryburn and Kaplan Thompson are work and uh, Warren Construction are working on uh, the first living building challenge in Maine right now, the, the Osako Ecology School. It's a, it's a real leadership program, but it's, uh, it's not something that's going to get broad adoption um, anytime soon. There's the, there's the Bullet Center in Seattle. Um, so after a few, uh, so, so with a pretty good house house idea, um, at the time I was blogging for Green Building Advisor regularly. So uh, Dan asked if I'd if I'd write write up a summary of what we talked about, and it got a lot of attention. Um, and but a after eight years, uh, the uh, UN's uh, International Panel on Climate Change released their interim report. Um, that made things look pretty dire. So we decided, so, so Dan decided to, to revisit it. And at, at the time I had recently started our local BS and beer group and we revisit it as well. So we brainstormed, you know, what would the pretty good house look like today? Um, and this is sort of the key, the key thing um, that we need to greatly reduce greenhouse gas emissions as soon as we can at current rates we uh, we may use up our our carbon debt in eight years, which tips which puts us over the balance point of uh, 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 cl cl climate disruption. Um, some of you may have seen a uh, graph like this before. It's um, it's fr from the, the the UN's data on where 
climate, where carbon emissions come from. You know, um, those of us in the building world are sort of responsible for the orange and gray sections. The orange is uh, operating carbon. The gray is embodied carbon. Um, what does that mean? Um, in Bruce King's uh, book, The New Art Carbon Architecture, he, he describes it like this. This, this isn't, um, this isn't a, an, an, an accurate data, uh, an accurate graph data-wise. There's um, embodied carbon is actually often a bigger chunk, but essentially on day one over here on the left, you haven't started using any carbon yet. So basically the embodied carbon, the, the carbon emissions that come with the materials you put into the building, are all spent on day one and they basically hold steady over the life of the building while the operating energy is what matters in the long term. So over the course of 100 years, which is how global warming potential is calculated, operating carbon really dwarfs embodied carbon, but we don't really have 100 years. We have 20 or maybe even 10 years. So if we look at a 10 year scale, embodied carbon matters a lot. So um, we aren't gonna solve climate change with you know, building slightly better, but we have to do what we can. Um, so again, the orange and the gray are the areas where we have some control over. Um, so what is a pretty good house? So, uh, this pretty much goes back to our first, our first um, metrics we came up with, our first, first criteria um, that are pretty universal. And then we developed some that were more regionally appropriate. But for us, uh, for what, what we brainstormed as a group was that, you know, um, the, the tiny houses are probably not the, the, way, the way of the future, but we can't all be living in three and 4,000 square foot houses. So a couple, you know, a couple should be able to live comfortably in 1,500 square feet, um, et cetera. As, as you add kids, you don't add kitchens and dining rooms. So the numbers don't go up proportionately. Um, a pretty good house should have photovoltaic panels or be PV ready. Um, possibly community solar would be a, would be a better option, but just sh sh be thinking about uh, energy generation. Uh, pretty good house should be simple and durable, easy to air seal, insulate. There are all kinds of advantages. Um, use plant-based building materials. Here in the Northeast, we have a lot of wood. Um, a lot of it's sustainably harvested. It's important that if you are using wood that it is sustainably harvested. Um, uh, air source heat pumps um, may, may not make sense in every project, but on a pretty good house, you can usually get away with a couple of heat pumps to heat the project for really minimal operating costs. Um, invest in your envelope until basically until it stops making sense, um, which is a criticism of the passive house world. It really goes to the nines, which is great, but often we don't have to go quite that far and we can still reduce the heating system. Um, and a lot of us in the building world have found that, you know, once you learn air sealing techniques, hitting an ice even 1.0 ACH 50 is not that hard. Um, once you reach 1.0, maybe you find it's not that hard to reach 0.6 or lower um, per the passive house standard, but there are diminishing returns below 1.0. Uh, use good windows. We have amazing window technology now. Take advantage of it. Uh, keep things simple and safe. So not just the construction, but the... Um, systems and everything should be owner proof and repairable and it should not look like a Rube Goldberg invention. Um, be part of a sustainable community, uh, which means using local labor and materials whenever possible. Um, have access to, to community solar jobs and services. So you're not driving 60 miles every time you need a gallon of milk. There's not, that's not a very green approach. Uh, in the Northeast, we have a lot of existing houses. So whenever possible, it's good to renovate. A lot of the uh, existing things like, uh, like basements are, are, um, are, are, are heavy carbon emitters. So it's good to just take advantage of what's, what's there and just re renovate it to, to work for you. Um, a pretty good house should not be a one hit wonder in the middle of the woods. You know, bamboo flooring does not make every project green. Um, extreme levels of energy efficiency, depending on the materials used. You know, if you're building super energy efficient with, with hemp, then you're probably good to go. If you're building super energy efficient with a lot of uh, foam or even mineral wool, then the carbon payoff may not be worth it. Uh, minimize use of concrete. Um, concrete is responsible for a significant portion of uh, global carbon emissions. Minimize or eliminate use of foam, especially XPS and closed cell, particularly HFC blown foam is the worst, but really uh, in a pretty good house with good design, there should be no reason to have to use foam above grade. And it's possible to do foundations without foam or concrete, uh, believe it or not. Um, 
a pretty good house uh, eliminates or at least minimizes combustion appliances, um, especially fossil fuel burning ones. And a uh, pretty good house does not have toxic or unhealthy materials, duh. Uh, designing and building high performance homes is complicated. A house is a system. So it's not necessarily something you, every contractor can just jump right into. It takes some training. Um, we're, we're trying to help out with a pretty good house website that has a roadmap and guideposts to help people, but we don't, you can't learn how everything you need to know at pretty good house right now, but it's a good place to start with a baseline knowledge. Uh, we don't have any central agency. There are no fees. If you feel like you've met the pretty good house uh, challenge, then feel free to buy yourself a plaque or send Dan $50 and he'll send one. Uh, and um, if you do start a local discussion group, which we do encourage, then the guideposts uh, make good discussion group topics. Uh, here's that roadmap. The, uh, if you're not colorblind, then you'll see the orange blobs are the uh, guideposts and then the green blobs are sort of, you know, the, the ideas that come off those. This, this was uh, actually put together um, by Dan and Steve and I, and mostly Chris Briley did this part. We were going to write a book years and years ago, but we didn't. So this, this is the uh, index or the table of contents from our uh, book that never happened. Um, again, uh, go to the prettygoodhouse.org or prettygoodhouse.com if you want to learn more. And there are links there to a bunch of different articles and other and websites. So that is the, that is my brief history of the Pretty Good House. And I'm really excited to hear from these guys on what Pretty Good House means for their locations. Um, so let's, um, and we never did ask you guys what you're drinking or if you wanna add anything. So as part of your presentations, uh, if you have presentations, um, actually we, we haven't confirmed that yet, but if you, if you have a presentation, you wanna mention anything else that we missed, any hobbies or books or uh, beverages, feel free to go. Um, Maybe should we start with 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 Dan? Do you want to talk about what Pretty Good House means means for you? <laughs> <laughs> My life in a Pretty Good House. Yeah, I've got a. Um, I do have a presentation. Um, so what do I do? Air screen. <laughs> what is that? It's it's green, at the bottom. Uh, yeah. Where the pictures are, you look at the bottom. Okay. Yeah. It's increased. Disabled attendee screen share. You got to make me a panelist first. Oh. You should be a panelist. I think. Uh, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> try, yeah, you should be a panelist. Is, 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 is there a green button at the bottom oh, of your screen? Now now we're in. Now I'm yeah. In. Okay, let's see. What are you drinking? Oh, I am drinking a. Um, I am drinking a Belfast Bay Oatmeal Stout. Well, you can't see it. All right, so is my screen up? Yes. A screen is up. Okay. Uh, so um, I am going to quickly go through a house that um, actually Mike designed. We built it about a year and a half ago. Uh, and it is very pretty good house-ish. Um, so I will kind of blast through this. I'm happy to talk about thing more in depth later. Um, here is the, uh, the bogey intern. Uh, you can see, so this is, you know, it's slab on grade. We did not do a great job minimizing concrete, but you know, we do the slab as thin as possible, which is four inches. You can see we did a careful job um, taping. Is my cursor showing up? Yes. Okay. Uh, we did a good, you know, we taped all the penetrations carefully, taped all the seams. Um, the house was pretty simple. We actually got sponsored by Huber for this house. So we used a lot of zip product, uh, which, you know, I have, whatever. I think it's a perfectly good product. I think it's fantastic that it exists. I think it allows anybody to build a reasonably tight house very easily. Um, it was a trust roof. And as you'll see later, um, it's an unfinished attic with loose fill um, cellulose. This was, we used zip since we had as much zip as we wanted. We used that for our air seal the ceiling, um, then double strapped it. So the electricians would have plenty of room for wiring and boxes. Um, and again, as I said, we uh, loose filled from there. So then it's double stud construction which many of you know 
is my, you know, is how I like to build. Uh, we just had a piece in Fine Home Building a couple of months ago on, um, on it. Um, so uh, this is, over here is a scrap of plywood just to block off the bays. You know, I can't remember how often we did them every maybe six, eight feet just to keep the, um, the, the dense packer from having to fill, you know, the whole wall as one unit to break it down into cells. Uh, we, this is the first time we actually used the um, Prosico, which makes their, the zip, the, the, whatever that stuff is called. I don't know. I can't remember what zip calls it, um, but they're liquid flashing. Um, so we built a, this is Brian uh, practicing. We built a, you know, we built a mock up in the shop to get used to what we were doing before we made a mess in the house. Here it is on the house. Here is a window in. Um, so we like this product a lot. Um, you know, we don't, it's, it's pricey and it's slow, um, but, but we think it does a great job. Um, so then we just, you know, we started siding. Obviously, I, you know, I assume I don't need to tell everybody here the virtues of a rain screen, but um, frankly, if I had to say, you know, if I had to say what's the, what's the most critical thing, I'd say right after air sealing, I would probably put a rain screen as the most important part um, of our construction. Um, and I guess at this point, I'll just say, you know, we're obviously building in a cold climate. We're in Southern Maine, um, zone six. I, you know, debate the whole vapor permeability issue, but at this point I basically go, I mean, there's two things I go by. One is to basically keep it pretty vapor open. And the other is to make sure that we are increasing in permeance as we, as I mean, I'm sorry, yeah, we increase in permeance as we head toward the exterior. Uh, so again, uh, this is, as Mike was saying, this is um, a lot of local materials. Uh, this is metal siding, but you'll see there's a lot of cedar. Um, it's PV ready. It's well sited for it. Um, they didn't have the money for it to start with, but we poked conduit up into the um, unfinished attic, so it'd be easy to add later. Um, we spend a lot of time on penetrations, both exterior. These are some shrouds that Ben found um, for the um, line sets for the uh, heat pumps. Uh, they're great. They've got a little gasket on the inside that you shove the line sets through. And then it's basically like any other, you know, wall cap where you put it on and then you either tape around it or whatever, but it's flashed. Um, so we think those are great, certainly much better than, uh, you know, these are not easy ones. These are not easy penetrations to um, take care of. On the inside, uh, you know, these are some duct work, you know, very, again, very carefully made sure we we're sealing it to our air barrier. Um, here's some cedar, as you can see, a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, we're lucky in Maine and, the, and this part of the world, a lot of our white cedar either comes from Maine or from uh, Quebec province. Uh, so then we're getting ready to close things in. We made sure that, you know, we check our moisture levels on our framing as we get ready to dry in, make sure it's dry. Um, we also, another critical element that I think is a, of a pretty good house is an owner's manual. So before we insulate, we uh, go through and take pictures of every square inch of uh, exterior and interior walls so that the client will know later on where everything is. If there's a problem uh, or if they want to change something, they know where the wiring and the pipes is. So there's, you know, hundreds of pictures like this one. This is a ceiling. Um, but you know, there's we when, when we give the client to it on a thumb drive at the end of the job. We also have started doing a lot of um, monitoring. So we buried some sensors in a few locations. We use the Omnisense ones. They connect, uh, did, you know, they connect over Wi-Fi to a gateway that you leave in the client's house. Uh, the batteries should last for you know five to ten years. Here are some of the reports you can get, and I can return to these later. The Three that we mostly look at are um, temp relative humidity and um, wood moisture equivalent. Uh, we also have a FUBOT that we are using, that we've left in this house. We actually are not crazy about the level, so we need to get back and deal with it. But we wouldn't have known that without the FUBOT. It does um, CO2 equivalent. Um, 
you know, particles, small particles, and um, uh, humidity, and VOCs, I'm sorry. We also did a sense energy monitor, which I'm sure many of you know. It's not great. Um, hopefully they'll be getting better. Oh, and back to the FUBOT. Unfortunately, it sounds like they're making a new product line. They're actually not selling anything right now, but it sounds like they're coming out with sort of a distinct residential and commercial line that will hopefully be out soon. Um, the sense energy monitor is cool in that you just clip it onto your main and, and it supposedly recognizes different things based on their, um, based on the sine waves of the startup. But uh, the complicated things like uh, heat pumps with multiple motors and ECM motors uh, has a hard time picking up. So, uh, and that's obviously mostly typically what we're interested in is the heat pump. Um, so on the job we're currently building, uh, we're using this new um, Leviton product called the, um, blanking on the name, load center maybe. But anyway, what it is, is it's, it's a, a circuit by circuit monitoring system. And uh, you can either use standard Leviton breakers, or if you want to monitor a certain circuit, you buy these fancier breakers um, and it gives you um, through Leviton, there's a website that you can check your, um, check your uh, usage of those circuits. So we're actually, we're looking forward to seeing what that comes up with. Uh, you know, again, we use a lot of, you know, pine is obviously huge in Maine. Um, these stairs, I think, were there originally wanted to do a lot of metal, and we talked them into this. Um, look terrific, I think. Uh, this is, again, some more cedar and very simple um, screened-in ports. We just bought some relatively inexpensive screen door panels and put those up. And that's the house. I just wanted to say, um, you know, that Mike did a great job adhering to some of the basic elements, which is the roof lines are very simple. It's a, um, you know, the main, the main structure is a two story gable. And then there's a um, little shed roof off the side. Um, so very little engineering. I always like to say that engineering is the, uh, and engineering is the enemy um, since it makes it, you know, it makes it that much harder to avoid thermal bridging. Um, you know, good sighting, good windows, um, and re relatively modest. I mean, you know, it's hard doing when you're doing when you're doing custom work. The size issue is always the toughest barrier to break, I think. And that's it. Hey, great job! Thanks, I was I was Thanks, just getting ready to give you your two minute warning. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, can I can I ask a question, Dan, before we move on? Um, so you you said I, I believe I heard you say that um, that you think that the two most important um, aspects of a, a pretty good house are air sealing and a rain screen detail. And so I was wondering if you could just take a minute to elaborate on why you think those two aspects of a pretty good house are so important. Uh, I guess because uh, if you don't have those, everything else is kind of you're sabotaging your project, right? I mean, I can, you know, we do 12 inch thick walls. We could do eight inch thick walls. We could do, you know, whatever. We could use different problems. I mean, I love dense pack cellulose, but if you do a good job air sealing, you can get away with whatever insulation you want to use. Um, so I just, you know, so air seal is just, it's the most, you know, nothing else good happens without air sealing. Um, and the rain screen, and again, you know, this is very much based on my experience here in Northern New England, and I'll be curious to hear um, what other people have to say about it. But you, know, if you want, I mean, there's two reasons for a rain screen. There's the bulk water from the exterior, and there's the vapor drive from the interior. Um, and, you know, just it's, it's in terms of dirt, it is a, uh, makes your assembly a lot more bomb proof, right? It makes it a lot more forgiving, a lot more durable, um, it gives a place for mistakes to go and not cause problems. And even not just mistakes, but just the natural, you know, water is everywhere. You know, water, water is the enemy. Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah. All right, so I stopped sharing, there we go. Yeah, um, who wants to go next? Maybe Al Allison, do you wanna? Sure, <clears throat> yeah, sure. I'll go next. So oh, uh, before I do that, 
So I am drinking um, Bell's Oberon tonight. It's, oh, you can't see it. Uh -huh. It's lost in the duck. There it is. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a Bell's Oberon. No, I'm, a, I'm a magician too, a juggler and a magician. Look at that. So it's a Bell's Oberon, a wheat beer. And let me uh, share my screen here. Got a little presentation for you. Oh, I got to hit that other button. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I can't see what you're seeing, but uh, I, so you see the screen says the pretty good house in a mixed humid or hot humid climate. Yes. Um, All right. We do, do do see icons over on the left, Allison. I don't know if you have a way to maximize your screen. It doesn't really matter, but. Yeah, I, I, I tried to do that. And yeah. Yeah. It looks, yeah, it looks I, good. Not, it's nope, good. Well, it's, oops, it's fine. What nope. happened there? Uh -oh, see, see, I, I should not comment uh -oh. on anything technical. Uh oh. Fucked it up. Yeah, where did it go? <laughs> oh, it went up there. Huh. Okay. <laughs> All right. I just want to remind you that Allison has a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, That's good. So, I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and um, I have also spent uh, about three decades in hot, humid climates. So Atlanta is a mixed, humid climate. It's pretty nice here. We have three pretty even seasons, and it doesn't get too humid in the summer, although I'm sure plenty of people would disagree with me on that. And it doesn't get too hot. Well, I mean, it gets into the 90s, but um, that's not bad compared to South Louisiana or Houston, where I grew up, or Florida, where I lived. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, the southern version of the pretty good house. And the, the big priorities, I mean, um, Mike did a great job covering the, you know, the, the carbon issue that we all face and, and how important that is. I'm going to talk just about the house here. So the, the big priorities are comfort, health, quiet, durability, and energy efficiency. And, and kind of in that order for me, energy efficiency is the last of that list, uh, not to diminish the, the impact of climate change. But you know, just thinking about the house itself, it, it has to be comfortable, it has to be healthful for the people living in it, or, or um, it's not going to be worth living in. And quiet is also important, and um, durable is very important. So Jan was just talking about the importance of rain screens and air tightness. And, uh, and then energy efficiency, of course, you know, we don't want something to bankrupt us or, or kill the climate. So. There's one thing, and, and this goes to your question, Brian, also, the one thing that impacts all five of these is air tightness. Because if, if the house isn't tight, you're gonna get drafts, that, uh, or you're gonna bring in humidity in my part of the world that make it uncomfortable, and you're gonna um, bring in pollutants from the garage, you're gonna bring in moisture into the wall cavities and rot things out, you're going to, um, uh, make it less efficient and, and, and also noise travels with air. So it, it impacts all of those things. So air tightness is, is, you know, I would say the most important thing to, to accomplish. Uh, well, okay, so first liquid water. I mean, you gotta, you gotta control the rain. Um, that's, that's number one, air is a close second behind that. And they are, they go together as well. Uh, I say, I would say for, for the southeast, anyway, where I live, the the number that I like is is less than three ACH fifty, which actually, for my climate zone, climate zone three is what the IECC specifies. Unfortunately, our state decided not to go that far, but instead to set it at five. We stuck with seven for a long time after leading the country in 2010, 2011, by adopting that, and then. Uh, we hung out there for until last year. We finally got to five ACH 50. But three ACH 50 is, is where I want to be with a pretty good house. And um, that's, that is not that hard to do. Uh, a lot of builders, when we first adopted the seven ACH 50 here in Georgia, a lot of builders aiming for seven found that they were hitting four and five, um, just aiming for seven. And so hitting three is a little bit more than that. It's not that hard to do. For mechanical ventilation in the southeast, my first choice would be a ventilating dehumidifier. 
bring in the outdoor air and dehumidify it. We do have humidity here. And th this is especially important if you're in climate zone two and, and on the coastal areas, you know, anywhere along the Atlantic seaboard from probably Virginia down all the way across Florida and uh, down all the way to, um, to the tip of Texas. So um, ventilating dehumidifier. Where I am in Atlanta, ventilating dehumidifier is also good. Uh, uh, ERV could be an alternative for somebody who wanted to get the balanced ventilation. So that's my uh, my choice for ventilation in a um, pretty good house. Heating and cooling. I want a system not like the one that, that's designed there, but I want a system that's designed, first of all. That was not designed. That was just thrown in with whatever they had on the truck that day, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I want nice fittings. You see the nice uh, radius um, elbows there. This is this is the system in my attic, by the way. I've got a spray foam attic, and I've got two Mitsubishi ducted mini splits up there, and they work wonderfully. I love it. And I, I designed the fittings for um, low pressure drop, low equivalent length, and uh, we get good airflow and it, it, it's really good. So design, first of all, you know, designed, good airflow, and high MERV filtration. Those, those are three essentials for me. The efficiency, I mean, even if you go with um, 13 or 14 SEER, I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, and our, well, we have the ducted mini splits here, so we're higher than that. But the, the most important thing is have it designed properly, get good airflow, and do high MERV filtration. And to get High MERV filtration, in case you're wondering, I've written about it. Um, you need about two square feet per ton of capacity. So two square feet of filter area for each ton of capacity, for, for each 400 CFM of airflow that you're moving through there. So um, insulation. So let's talk about that. Uh, slab edge for, for down here. Under the slabs, not so important for the southeast, but the slab edge is important. That's where most of the heat loss happens in winter. Most of the heat gain happens in summer. Slab edge, R10, crawl space or basement walls, R10. Um, above grade walls, R20. And actually, you know, you can do passive house, FIA certified ha uh, house in the southeast with, with an R20 above grade wall. So um, that, that could still be passive house. Ceilings are 40 in the southeast. I mean, you know, insulation is not as important for us where our winter design temperature is 23 here in Atlanta uh, as it is for you where it's um, negative 40 <laughs> or zero or whatever it is. Uh, I like to uh, reuse materials. So when I go to fast food restaurants, I save all the boxes and, and throw them up in the attic. Uh, I can't hear anybody. That, that's a joke. That's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> this is a home inspector who took one of our classes one time and gave me these pictures. He, he found this in somebody's house. Somebody actually thought this was a good idea. It's, it's bad for so many reasons. So don't do this. This is not a good idea. Windows. So first thing about windows, um, you know, double pane low E is good enough for down here. We don't need triple pane windows. Double pane low E with good U values, good solar heat gain coefficients. And What's even more important about windows is to limit how much of them you have. The window to wall ratios are critical. And, and, that, and that's true in all climates. That's not just a Southeast thing. The, uh, this picture is from Robert Bean's new book. By the way, if you haven't got that, it's free. You can download it. It's a PDF. And uh, he's got a lot of good stuff about thermal comfort in there. It's principles of thermal comfort. So he's talking about this house, which has nearly 100% window to wall ratio, which is very, very bad for thermal comfort. Um, even in Calgary, where he lives, it, it's, I mean, you, you might think, oh, you're going to get a lot of sunlight in and that'll warm up the house. But no, it, it, it can actually overheat the house in winter with a good building enclosure otherwise. And um, so you want to keep the window to wall ratio in the 20 to 40% range. And um, the last thing I want to talk about is comfort because, you know, I like to jump on the bed naked sometimes. And uh, when you jump on the bed naked in front of a big window, you, you got to think about the mean radiant temperatures involved. You know, the, the surface temperature of the human body is about 90 degrees. And say on a really cold day, you know, it's like 35 degrees outside, super cold. You're going to be losing heat to that window. And 
Um, so you gotta you gotta have the good windows, and uh, and that's another important thing about the windows. So I think that was my last slide. Yep, that's it. Thank, thank you, Allison. Yeah, yeah. I um, yeah, yeah. Ne ne neither Dan or I hit on um, what 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 our our, our north. North, northeast our, our our values are but uh we go with, with joe stubrick's recommendation of you know our 20 uh mm -hmm. foundation our 40 walls our 60 roof yep. um so it's, it's interesting that, that about and with those numbers it's really hard it's possible but hard to meet passive house you have to have every everything else has to be absolutely perfect to meet passive yep. house so, yep. so it's interesting that you can meet passive house with lower numbers one takeaway from that is maybe we shouldn't be building single family houses in such difficult climates uh, but yep. we also work with a design of 15% window to wall ratio or less. Uh, oh. in, 15 in, or less. 15 window or to less. wall or window to floor? Uh, window to wall, wall. ratio. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's cold yeah. here. We need more yeah. insulation. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that, that's good. But, 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 but when you get below 15%, um, it's, 15% is, is also where walls start to magically look good. When you get below 15%, you have to mm -hmm. be really, really creative or, or else you end up with walls that look like bunkers. Yeah. Yep. Um, Allison, do, does your, um, does your uh, fresh air dehumidification system create extra heat inside the envelope? Uh, so it, it does create a little extra heat, but the main thing it does, it is converting latent heat to sensible heat because you're taking the humidity out of the air, all that latent heat that's there, and you're condensing it and that becomes sensible heat. With a really efficient dehumidifier, the one I showed was by Ultra Air, um, and they have really efficient dehumidifiers, then you don't get as much extra heat from the, the running of the compressor and the, and the fan in it. So, but you, yeah, it does add some. Uh, generally, you don't have to add anything to the load calculation mm -hmm. for that additional heat because mostly what you're doing is you're converting latent to sensible in the house. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, any other question? Any other quick questions for Allison? We can move move on to Jeff. Then come back around and um, just we had a we have someone in the chat asking, can I ask a question? And so I just want to um, remind anyone who's here that ask questions in the in the chat and I'll try to bring them to the light in the discussion. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so uh, mo most most importantly, J Jeff. Do you have, have a beverage tonight? Are you drinking anything? Sadly, uh, I was juggling, preparing, and getting my two kids in the car. And I was going to bring some homemade mead that my stepson and I just made. And I regrettably left it at home. So I am sober and <laughs> <laughs> alert, <laughs> which is probably a good thing right Sounds now. Sounds good. But if if I if I if I if I had a beer, it would have probably been a Lagunitas. Nice, yeah, classic. So probably probably after this is all over. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, should I set yes, up my screen please. share? Let's see. Jeff Frozen. Yeah, I think we can see your screen, Jeff, on your computer, but we can't hear you talking exactly. anymore. Are you getting the full? So I'm going to be, can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, hello? Yes. There. Yeah, we got you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a house that I designed and that uh, is actually for myself and my family. And the firm that I work for, Atmosphere Design Build, uh, did um, the construction with me kind of being the co-general co contractor. Because for those of you that follow or subscribe to Fine Home Building, our firm 
atmosphere design build, which is run by Mila Green and Dave Good, were also uh, their home that they were also building at the same time uh, was the 2018 Pro Home for fine home building. And so we we're concurrently building our own homes and it was a bit of a crazy time. But um, I started working for atmosphere design build in 2015 and um, really got immersed in we're both passive house consultants as well as just general um, building science geeks and just really got immersed in reading and learning as much as I could um, right at the get-go. Um, everything, you know, from, uh, you know, building, um, buildingscience.com um, to Green Building Advisor, Fine Home Building, and um, learned about the Pretty Good House through um, subscribing to Green Building Advisor and just gleaned as much as I could from everything that I was learning. And one thing that I discovered was that a lot of the building science was heavily biased to the Northeast and uh, was trying to figure out a way to tailor a lot of those concepts to a more kind of temperate climate. We're at 1500 foot elevation in um, the Sierra foothills. Um, kind of go over the project summary. And um, I was now I know how to do modeling and woofy, and we generally, for most of our projects, I've become the designated woofy modeler. Um, I didn't know how to do it for my house, so I was basically using kind of our best practices. Um, you'll see, I'll show some finished photos at the end, but generally ascribe to fewer but larger windows um, as opposed to. Um, although in this shot, there's this one kind of narrow window, but generally speaking, tried to have fewer windows that were larger. Uh, and I'll go over the assemblies in a little bit. So just to give you a quick project summary, uh, it's 19, 1,986 square feet, uh, two stories. Uh, it's a stacked two-story structure, um, which uh, simplified the air sealing approach. And like I said, we're in the lower Sierra foothills kind of right at the edge between 3B and 4B, which is a pretty forgiving climate um, for um, our insulation approach. Um, it's an all electric home, um, doesn't quite yet have, um, is net zero ready or zero net energy ready. Um, I'm gonna be building a kind of air, air barn carport this summer for um, the photovoltaic ins installation. Um, so far, just from tracking our energy use or around 5,000 kilowatt hours per year, um, but we just started le using a Nissan LEAF in November, and so that has changed, but as far as not including that, that's about where we're at. Um, I went with the approach of um, two uh, ductless mini splits, one upstairs, one downstairs, and kind of designed the house as far as the orientation of the rooms um, around specifically around the ductless mini split approach. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, used a Brown uh, HRV unit. Um, we're using a heat pump water heater, which is located um, in a vertical um, closet that provides the, the volume needed for the heat pump, but it's outside the condition space. Um, we went with double pane windows and doors. It's interesting, I'm modeling a house right now for um, a client um, that's at an even more moderate um, climate nearby. And we're actually finding that um, instead of using exterior insulation, we're recommending, um, we are looking at using triple pane windows. Um, in Woofy, we're finding that the, the energy benefit is substantially greater for that that kind of window as opposed to exterior ins insulation. It's an interesting conversation we're having in our firm and people want to discuss that more with me late at the end. Um, I'd be happy to talk about that. On mine, I settled on um, Sierra Pacific windows. I like the fact that they're more or less locally made. I have some issues with forestry practices, but it is locally, um, locally available timber, locally um, owned and locally made, um, and we use the, the the best possible low low E glass available. Um, you can see the the U factor and solar heat gain. in in California, um, especially at, at kind of our 
climate, um, we're, I'm finding that going with the lower heat gain is more the appropriate approach, especially with climate change. We're at a kind of tricky balance between cooling and heating, so I'm not looking for assess excessive heat gain. Um, you can see um, our home at the time of the 2016 California code uh, exceeded the code by 34%, which is pretty good. And we have applied and received a rebate through the California Advanced Homes Program, um, which was basically kind of paid, paid for a few of our <laughs> energy efficiency measures. Um, so just one thing I just wanted to kind of mention was in, while we we're constr in, in construction, as uh, everyone knows, California um, is dealing with a lot of um, fire um, issues. And so actually during construction, you can see the red arrow, how close it came within our house. And you can see the fire trucks that came within 150 feet of our house. This was all those big fire events back in October 2017. And um, our neighbors happened to have gravity fed um, high volumes of gravity fed water um, and they actually got trapped and stayed behind and helped protect our house and then fire trucks were able to come in later and and cut line to protect our home so we got incredibly lucky and so I've been we think a lot about fire um, and I'll talk about that a little bit as I talk about the assemblies um, so I'll just kind of guide you just real quickly through our floor plan. So like I said, it's it's a stacked floor plan. It's two stories. One thing, just as an architect and coming from a, and a more um, a background originally where I was working in a kind of more avant-garde architectural uh, world, I was interested in kind of finding this balance point between following good practice with the pretty good house approach and also kind of pushing the limit a little bit on the, the just the formal architecture. And so what I found was by um, using a ventilated attic that basically had a, where the air barrier is flat at the ceiling, I could be a little bit more um, creative and plan. And so, and some of this was formally driven, but it was also functionally driven where um, I made some cutaways to the kind of nominal rectangular form of the building to create some interest as well as to frame views, um, provide um, better cover for, for doorways, um, as, as well as to not have square footage where I didn't need it. There's some downsides as far as a little bit of additional thermal bridging and, and adding to the kind of perimeter of the shape, but I found that that was for a home that, of this size that that was pretty negligible as far as the energy consequences. So the, um, the home has the kind of an entry hall that you enter in. Um, let's see if I can. If, uh, there we go. Um, an entry hall. Um, and I kind of organized all the workspaces around the entry. Um, I really like to not have to be looking for my shoes at kind of various doors. So generally, we're going out kind of the side door out to our gardens and, and kind of land projects and having a more formal entry off of the mudroom is a nice efficient kind of circulation pattern in a waste space that's easy to kind of drop off my, my uh, computer bag when I come home. And then the kitchen is in the center and acts as a kind of central hub. Um, we spend a lot of time in the kitchen. And then the great room is pretty compact, but um, provides, it's kind of more after all the kind of activity of the entry and kitchen. And so it feels a little bit more relaxed when you're in that space. And then that opens up to um, what will be a future kind of back patio. Um, and then the, um, let's see, it's not. Hey Jeff, while you're on this floor plan, someone asked if you could point to the location of your mini split heads, your indoor Great. units. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we create, I, so Mila, Mila and I were, the one thing that we struggle with with the um, mini splits is the, just the visual appearance. Um, we're a little bit snooty that way, but <laughs> um, so I, I, I wanted to be really intentional about um, the positioning of them. And so you'll see there's this like little bit of a recess and because we have a nine foot ceiling, it works fine to position it above the door. And so the mini splits are going to be stacked both here as well as at the, the second floor. 
Um, you'll see in maybe one of the photos, the refrigerator compartment here doesn't go all the way up to the ceiling. So it has good throw um, all the way out to the, to the great room. And so by locating it as far as possible to one end of the house, it works pretty well as far as the distribution. And then also the stairwell being kind of alongside that um, helps with the recirculation of the air. Um, we try to just use the downstairs in the winter and the upstairs in the summer. Um, we don't need it too much during the summer, actually. Um, let's see, maybe I can't do that with the, oh, there we go, okay. Then upstairs, um, you'll see in the photos, there's this kind of open stair, um, kind of using the stairwell to get, we didn't want to have, my wife really didn't like, doesn't really like tall vaulted spaces, but we have this really kind of steep view to the north. So I use the stairwell and a tall window along the stairwell that you'll see in some of the finished photos to gain some of that height that I wanted, as well as here at the entry, um, the floor is pulled away um, for a tall vertical window. And so when you come up the stairs, so we have a little bit, it might not be ideal from a real estate standpoint, but we intend to live here for a long time. We have all the bedrooms clustered at one end, um, a kind of private or a kind of semi-private den that we call the book nook, um, which is like a library and where we can watch a movie as a family upstairs, kind of away from the, um, the hubbub below. And then instead of having a, a de dedicated master bath, um, and this was actually driven by my wife, she really does, doesn't want the smells and sounds of the of a bathroom near the bedroom. And so we consolidated um, everything into a single family master bath and then kind of partitioned it. So there's a standalone tub room, a kind of central area with the vanity, um, a shower, just with the shower curtain. We'll see how my daughter feels about that when we get older or she gets older. And then there's a, um, a standalone uh, kind of old fashioned water closet for the toilet and and then this right here is actually the location of our HRV unit, which allows for a straight shot to um, all the bedrooms and a vertical chase for reaching the utility spaces below. And again, the mini split is mounted above the door here. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, okay. yep. Jeff, just, uh, we have, um, just, just, we want to leave pl plenty of room for discussion. Yep. Um, so, so, so if you, if you, um, I, I I think you had had a bunch of photos as well, right? Or 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 was yeah, that? I, I can move. Sorry, I lost my connection. I can move yeah. quickly through the rest. Yeah, yeah. Just not, not to rush you, but just um, yep. we uh, there's some construction we, photos. Yeah. Um. Okay, quickly about the the assemblies. So we have a ventilated attic. Um, with a service cavity, which, like I said, allows for a simple air barrier at the ceiling, um, which allows for the variation in plan. Um, and again, similar to a lot of these projects, slab on grade. With the, your your uh, screen screen isn't on, on share, Jeff, at the moment. Okay. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. Um, let me get back. I interrupted you. That was the problem. <laughs> um, my... Let's see. I think it might have kicked you off altogether. I'm actually not seeing your secondary okay. screen. Um, oh, so, so, so while you're working on that, if you want to, we can take some questions from, from the audience. Um, my if apologies. You want. I didn't, I didn't no, my, don't worry care. about it. Okay. Hey, tonight's the name of the game tonight is technical difficulty. So go <laughs> for it. So, um. <laughs> well, how about, um, there was there was a pretty active discussion in the chat about um, energy modeling. So maybe um, Jeff Jeff had mentioned that he didn't actually do any energy modeling on this this house. Uh, so maybe some of you guys could comment on um, how important it is to um, do energy modeling. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes, yes. you're back. You're back. Okay, we'll come back to that. <laughs> that sounds good. My apologies. Um, so like I was saying, um, and I'll show some more photos. Um, we, I like the ventilated, I settled on the ventilated attic partly, like I said, my wife wasn't really into vaulted space and also just greatly simplified the installation of the insulation. Um, it's a pretty bomber 
easy to achieve um, air barrier. Um, I use the Intello membrane, um, partly just I wanted to see, test it out. And also I like the, that it was a little bit easier to install than um, OSB, which I think is a common thing to use for a ceiling air barrier. And then we, I did install a continuous service cavity, um, which allowed the uh, installation of all the, the systems to occur be below the air barrier, which I found pretty advantageous. Um, this is a photo of that um, approach. Um, just we wired the house so that all the critical loads are on a backup panel. Um, and we actually qualified for, there's a program where you can get a full rebate on two Tesla Powerwall batteries, um, which is pretty amazing. And so we're gonna be installing those at the, the carport that we're installing our photovoltaics on this summer. Um, we did do a blower door test and it came, it basically ended up topping out at around 0 0.95 ACH 50, which we're pretty happy with. Basically the windows we find are the weakest link. Um, everything else, all the taping and sealing and being meticulous, you know, we can, if with better windows, you know, this could have easily been um, close to half that, we, we feel like. Um, and just, I can go quickly through some finished photos. This is the, the one that you, you all might be familiar with from the, the promotion. Um, definitely happy that our home is kind of being used to spread the pretty good house movement. Uh, it's definitely flattering and very honored. Um, and so we definitely are, we're, Neil and I are both, and Dave, Neil and Dave and I are, we're certainly building science geeks, but we're also into very refined detailing and, and the craftsmanship side of it. And, and so um, hopefully that comes across in some of these photos. Um, a lot of meticulous details. You can see the, the mini split just tucked behind in that niche so that it feels really intentionally placed. Um, so again, you kind of come around and enter first into the kitchen, which um, is set, it's set up more for our, our day to day when we entertain. Mm -hmm. It's a little less formal, but um, we live in a pretty rural place and you know, that's, everyone loves, loves to hang out in the kitchen anyway. So we find it flows very nicely. Um, it's kind of simple detailing um, throughout these, these minimal kind of simple details are actually a lot more work sometimes as, as you guys know. I um, mean, this is kind of a shot, detail shot of the stair with a large window. My daughter um, plays with her dolls underneath the stair, which we wanted to kind of create a little social space near the kitchen, as you can see there. Um, the tub room. And thank you for your time. Thanks, Jeff. No, it's really just- Thank it's, you. It, 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 it's it's a beautiful house and as a as a designer i really appreciate um when you have a floor plan that looks as simple as that i think people who don't create floor plans for a living don't appreciate just what a puzzle you put together there but it's just it's, it's a very very efficient and flexible plan it's it's, it's an impressive project and and, and attractive okay can can you remind me what you used for the siding? Was that was it steel siding for for, for fire protection? Oh, are you frozen? We may have lost him. He yeah. might be. Oh, he's, he's like moving <laughs> just a little bit. I, I think he's alive. The weather. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> um, the uh, the site the where you see it's weathered. That's. Um, uh, core 10 steel siding, each kind of striation indicates an individual panel, um, which allows them to be um, no exposed fasteners. And so each one kind of slips into the next. And we, we pre weathered them on the ground and then installed them. And then in those moments where there's cutaways, um, we did a, a kind of a smooth trowel, three coat stucco, just to kind of um, break up the monolithic appearance. And like I said, the I wanted to have a really simple roof um, I feel like the roof is can get um, costly when you have lots of dormers and bump outs. And so I kept the primary roof, um, just a simple gable. Um, and then, like I said, played with the plan a little bit more. No, it's really nice. 
Um, I was going to say, to go back to Brian's question from before, um, when you were frozen, maybe you didn't hear it, and you were talking about doing energy modeling and, and Wolfie, there seemed to be quite a bit of discussion in the chat about um, how important it is to do that. Was that the question, Brian? Don't let me yeah, step on your thunder. A, no, it's okay. There was just a lot of, a lot of uh, commentary and questions about energy modeling in general, how important it is to do it for a project, and, and what um, software um, you all prefer to use and, and why? So we're, so um, Dave Good is a certified passive house consultant. He's the, the build side of atmosphere design build. Um, and I've, he's, I've basically gotten trained to, since I'm more in the computer world than he is on the day to day, it's more, um, it's just easier. I'm a little bit more um, used to doing that kind of work. And so I've taken on the the energy modeling here, and we typically try to do it for all of our, our all of our projects, and we kind of tape tune our window design and assembly choices based on that. Um, I, I I haven't gone back and modeled my house yet. I'd be curious to do that. I just, I just kind of relied on the energy modeling that our um, the kind of the, the Title Twenty Four energy consultant did, but for us, it's it's an essential part of our process. It's the same for me, and I don't remember, Dan, if it was Ben that mentioned it a couple of weeks ago or, or if it was someone else that said, um, if, if you're not, you know, modeling it or, or checking it, how do you know how well you did? So, um, you know, that's kind of a, a process that we, we do an energy model in all of our houses so we can evaluate. How do you get to a pretty good house? You know, how do you know if something is economically feasible for somebody to do if there's no way to verify how good of a decision it is? Emily, what do you use for software and, and why? Um, I use a couple of different things depending on what we're doing. Um, most of the time, uh, if I'm not doing a program, I use Ecotrope um, as a hers rater. It's a pretty easy program for me to bang out in about an hour. I fairly, I say fairly accurate. I mean, they're all kind of modifications of accuracy, but a, a fairly accurate idea of what we're doing and an ability to compare that to um, the standard uh, house according to whatever code is prevalent in the area that you're using, so. Yeah, I think I think when we first developed the, the idea or, or brainstormed ideas, uh, part of it was just to kind of cut through all the complexity and stuff, so it was basically conceived as a uh, as a prescriptive st st standard just use use r5 windows and r20 walls and and you're good to go um, after that uh, B opt was developed and I think I think energy modeling has gotten a lot more practice since then so like in, in three or four hours I can do a good good or a, a, a pretty good energy model enough to sort of inform like you know, maybe the walls don't have to be R forty. Maybe they can be R thirty five, and 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 that's good enough. Or or maybe the windows should have, uh, you know, low, low so, 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 so solar solar heat heat gain. So just it, it depends on the project. But I think I think you can do either a prescriptive path or a performance path as a designer and energy model. I prefer the performance path, but <laughs> uh, not everyone does energy models. Would you agree with that, Dan? Is that 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 how we started? You're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I thought the space, the space bar is not working for me. Um, anyway, yes, I agree. And I also think that you know, one of the things I like about energy modeling is less its predictive powers and more uh, the ability to compare different things, right? I mean, the basic physics is relatively simple. Um, so it's, you know, once you have it entered in, I mean, we all know how much when we let those goddamn homeowners live with their houses this year, up. Um, so, uh, you know, the ability to say these windows will make this difference is more valuable to me than, than saying this is what your energy costs are going to be. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, we use it more qualitatively in some ways than quantitatively. We'll, we'll try to model it, say, have two different models from the geometry and try, like I said, different windows or different assemblies and just see the qualitative difference. We don't get too attached to the specific numbers, but you can definitely get good apples to apples comparisons in the energy model and just kind of see 
oh, ch changing from this window type to this window type creates this percentage change and can advise accordingly. It gets a little bit trickier. You're trying to. Yep. There it goes, Jeff. <laughs> and then oh, back. things on my back. <laughs> yep, <my> back. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> We're out, we're out in the country here. Well, I can't do the Apollo mission. So anyways, yeah, we're, we're making good qualitative decisions that way. Yeah, I think somebody asked a good question about uh, the, the decision to go with triple pane versus or over exterior insulation. Um, how do you summarize that? Yeah, I'm, I'm jumping into Brian's territory here. Uh, oh, that's okay. I think Jeff brought that up in his presentation, right? Yeah, just yeah. What, yeah what, 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 why triple glaze versus double glaze? Now that we have good coatings and fills, the double glaze can do quite quite well. You no, know, you know, you can get 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 pretty low U values with a with a double glaze window. Now, why would you go to triple? Well, we find with um, with the 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 quality European style windows that are triple pane, they also greatly increase the air sealing potential, as well as they're just higher quality made windows in terms of longevity and just the, just the pleasure of the operation of the hardware. Um, so there's certain qualitative aspects there. It's not strictly a building science decision, but um, we are finding that because of the air sealing and um, when you start to model and woofy the, the heat loss that occurs at the window frame and uh, with the thermally broken frames that you get from triple pane windows, um, the, the um, NFRC ratings don't fully take that into account, we find. Um, and it's a little bit hard to model with the windows that don't have passive house, proper passive house data. So we have to approximate that, say on a Sierra Pacific window or a gelled WEN or a Pella kind of window. Um, so we have to kind of do the best we can, but the, all the features of the triple pane window, it's not just the U factor, it's the, how you calculate the window frame itself and the insulation values that can make a substantial difference, we find, as well as the air sealing increases. Was the question specific re related to your climate? Um, I know here for, for us, we've done it both ways. Um, um, we find the thermal comfort uh, which is something in Allison's presentation where it just said comfort was the the very first thing. Um, we have a couple of semi-customizable plan sets and we've built them with double pane windows and with triple pane windows. And the feedback that we've gotten from our clients, um, you know, just being able to kind of sit next to that window without having um, some kind of uh, honeycomb shade that they have to pull down in the evening uh, here in Maine, at least for us, uh, it, that extra pane of glass just adds a, a little bit more thermal comfort, um, even if it doesn't add that much R value or, or um, but I agree, they also are, they're like bomb proof. <laughs> so <laughs> they're, they're extremely durable. I mean, in our case, it probably would have been a $30,000 increase to the cost and I just couldn't go there. <laughs> Although, I mean, I, with the, it's interesting as a trade-off between that and doing exterior insulation. I regret, somewhat regretfully used foam insulation because that's what felt feasible at the time. I would have liked to tried something else, but it's interesting to consider that exchange between where you don't really truly need exterior insulation and can gain the, so much from the window selection. It's, it's an interesting conversation we're having. Also, the exterior insulation obviously adds complexity to the window detailing as far as how you trim them out, which is also um, a cost to, to consider on the labor side. So there were a, there were a couple of uh, a couple of questions along the way about ventilation strategies in, in, in the pretty good house. And um, so Allison, maybe this is one for you. I don't, I don't remember if you, if you how, how, how deep you got into ventilation in your, your presentation, but do you consider Balanced ventilation system of a, a, a must have in a pretty good house. No, not necessarily. Um, either either balanced or positive uh, or supply only with a ventilated dehumidifier. I like the ventilated dehumidifier, and, and 
and and some climates it's it's, it's um, essential. You know, with with good houses, with low sensible loads, uh, you still got the latent load coming in you know, from the people and the activities in the house, even if you get rid of it with air tightness and and with some of the ventilation. Um, so you you got to have some kind of way of dealing with that. And so ventilating dehumidifier, um, with, and that that can work fine with supply only. So that that the ventilating dehumidifier that you showed is that a supply only appliance? Well, it can be. Yeah, you can. Or it can be configured by itself. Way. If, if you set it up well, it um, it doesn't have to be ventilating. First of all, you could just have it recirculating air in the house. Okay. Um, but if you attach a duct to the outside, so you're, some of the air that you're bringing through the dehumidifier now is, is your ventilation air, and it gets um, dehumidified on the way in when it needs it. Um, we've got that in our office, and most of the time it runs, you know, in the winter, well, especially, it's um, the compress compressor never comes on. It's just bringing outdoor air in. So mm. it's a supply only system in that case. Right. And how about, uh, how about the rest of you on the, on the ventilation question? Do you have a, a particular strategy that is? We, I, I think, you know, I think in our climate, a balance, you know, we've tried not doing a balanced ventilation system. I, I think it's pretty critical. Um, you know, our houses are sealed up for so many months of the year that um, I think it's hard to get decent IAQ um, without it. I would agree with Dan. We're pretty much moving to totally balanced ventilation, um, both between being sealed up and then um, the advent of people really having allergies in the summertime. Um, I don't know if it's climate change and it's getting warmer and more things are blooming in Maine. Um, you know, but we've we've had a lot more conversations with our clients recently who are allergic to ragweed and everything else, and so now all of a sudden they're just keeping their windows closed all year round. So, um, you know, at that point, you you definitely. We have done, um, I won't say I haven't, but we have done exhaust only ventilation and um, it can work. It's better than nothing, obviously, but it's um, probably not our preferred method. And it's not as uh, client proof, we won't say idiot proof, but it's not as client proof <laughs> as, <laughs> as you might think. Uh, you know, some people complain that if they turn off the ERV, they might have the same issue, but I, I mean, people, turn off the bathroom vent fans and stuff too. And so it's, um... I, I would say it depends on, on two things. It depends on what climate you're in. So, you know, in, in Maine or a really cold climate, you know, balanced middle, cause you want it super airtight. Uh, and that's the other factor I would say is air tightness. So if you're at one ACH 50, um, in a cold climate, uh, balanced ventilation with recovery, not just balanced, but balanced with recovery. So an ERV or HRV would be the way to go. Um, in a, a milder climate with three ACH 50, you know, like where I am, I think positive, or I keep saying positive pressure, supply only uh, is, is okay. Yeah, I think, or yeah, I think Tra Travis has a good, good question is, is what, why, what's keeping everyone from doing pretty good houses? Is it material availability, small house size, window cost? Dan says, you know, low 200s per square foot, which is low in a lot of markets. Why isn't everyone doing pretty good houses? Anybody want to take a stab at answering that? Well, as I already said in the comments, I, I you know, I think it's the, I think that the pros aren't, aren't pushing this stuff. I think it's kind of a, you know, I don't think our houses are any more expensive. I think the upcharge for what we do up front is trivial. Um, and I think, you know, especially with double stud and cellulose, it's really a nominal cost. Um, and obviously the payoff is smaller heating system and lower operating costs. So, I, you know, I think we're saving clients money in the long run. Um, so I just think it's, you know, the dismal state of education in both architecture and contracting. I mean, I also think the financial system, as far as banks, mortgages, could right. drive it way more effectively if a bank knows that you can afford more because your operating costs are substantially lower as well as health. I mean, that's a little bit harder to measure, but I mean, this, it's, it's really, it's, it, we're, we're approaching it holistically from the ground up, but the, it needs to be approached from the top down, so to speak, in the same manner. And it's just, it's just not as harder to demonstrate, I suppose, to the powers that be how 
effective it is. It needs to be driven on the policy level too. Right. You know, the, the, comp, the whole comp issue for assessors, appraisers is a big issue, obviously. And it seems like that's slowly getting better as more of these houses come on the market and age enough that they're being sold. Curious, um, be, because this isn't a, uh, you know, a, a, a standard with a, with a system and a plaque and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, ha, ha, have you talked to your clients about uh, people who you've been designing and, and building houses for about this being a pretty good house? Have you, do you use that language with them and, um, and explain well, what this is, what this movement is all about? The movement. The movement. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I do because, you know, if you look, if you Google my name, you get the pretty good house pretty quickly. So often the clients are asking about it. So. I put it in all of my contracts because people ask me all the time, like, what do you mean when you say high performance or energy efficiency? And I'm like, hey, we we work to the pretty good house standard. And, and then it's on them to go and research, you know, what is pretty good house and what does that mean to me? So uh, we certainly use it a lot. And, and uh, to weigh in on what you said too, Dan, is it's a lot about education. I think last week on BSNB or somebody shared an appraisal institute uh, form that they submitted as part of it. Um, and they got significantly more value out of the house. And um, if we've done a good job, people aren't moving. So they're not on the market. So there's nothing for real estate agents to use as comparisons. So. Hey, I, if I can jump, change, go tangent, change the subject. A couple of people have raised my favorite subject on double wall construction, which is the uh, cold sheathing issue. Um, and and, and it, my second favorite dumb joke after a pretty good house is um, is I describe the uh, cold sheathing problem as the yeti of building science, much discussed but rarely seen. Um, you know, we've cut into a couple of our houses and have seen no, no evidence of uh, that there's condensation on the sheathing in any destructive way. We've got um, any, and just to back up a sec, the issue here is that, you know, you've got all this insulated. The way, the way our houses used to last was that there was no insulation, so we were kiln drying our houses every time we turned the heat on. Now with all this insulation, you know, the framing and the sheathing are staying cold for the winter um, and they can become a condensing surface. And then is there enough time in the warm weather for it to dry out before mold and rot sets in? So anyway, that's part of the reason why we put all these sensors in is to make sure our wall assemblies are safe. And to date, we have not seen, you know, that make us scared. You need it, you know, you need a good, you need a good cellulose installer, which is, I know, an issue in a lot of parts of the country. And if you'd like to learn more about Dan's system, you can check out the fine home building cover story from two issues ago. I don't know what, 200 issue two something. Right. Hey, look at that. There it is. Here we go. <laughs> that's, that's how you do it. it. It breaks all the rules of physics, yet somehow it works great. <laughs> right, don't do a woofy, don't do a woofy model on it. You never sleep again. <laughs> yeah, you're barking up the wrong tree if you do that. <laughs> I, I just want to mention too as people are dropping off here at the end as we hit 7 30 that uh you can save the chat box there's been a lot of great information by hitting the triple double dots on the bottom and hit save chat if you don't see it on your screen move the chat box from where it currently is located and it should pop up for you but if anyone has issues just let us know uh behind the scenes and we uh will send you the chat let me let me say one thing related. To, some a couple of people asked about uh, Robert Bean's book that I mentioned, and I posted a link in there to the LinkedIn group that you have to join to get the password and the download and everything. I, I don't. I, that's the only way I know of getting it. And if you look back in the chat to 6:59 p.m. is where I posted that link. 6:59 p.m. <laughs> a date that will live it in for me. <laughs> Excellent. Well, yes. Yeah, since we are are at oh actually o o over time a bit um let's just go around and get get a final thought if you don't have a final thought on the tip of your tongue then uh tell us what is your favorite resource for learning about building science and you don't have to worry about who sponsors this show it's uh whatever whatever works for you books websites whatever let's just start with us start with allison oh me okay so um <laughs> 
Well, I thought this was a pretty good episode of the Building Science BS Plus Beer Show. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and, um, f uh, favorite resource? Uh, I, probably the one that I go to most is buildingscience.com, Joe's website. They have everything. <laughs> yep. <laughs> How about Jeff? Yeah, I was going to say Energy Vanguard, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, building Buildingscience.com and uh, Green Building Advisor, of course. Yeah. Excellent. How about you, Dan? Any? Uh, yeah, any 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 last thoughts or resources you you would recommend? Uh, well, my last thought is you know. This is really uh, the whole pretty good house thing is really, uh, you know, there's no, there's no ownership. So I would encourage everyone to, to, to help out. You know, we, we uh, Emily and Robert Swinburne did a great job getting this website up, but it really could be a very valuable resource. So if anyone out there is interested, please get in touch with any one of us and we will gladly add you to the pretty good house uh, control room. Um, and my, you know, and I agree with Jeffrey and Allison on um, the stuff they like. Uh, you know, I think that Bill Rose's book, Water and Buildings, is is a, just a critical book to yeah. read at some point. You won't under the first time you read it, you'll understand maybe half of it. Um, but keep coming back to it, and it'll slowly start sticking. Look at there. Oh, well, well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> uh, so, uh, all right. but, uh, it's a great book, and Bill Rose is a really smart guy. And it's often at the Nessie conference. So if you're in northern New England, if you're in the Northeast and you uh, and we ever have it live again, come to the Nessie conference. There it is. There we go. <laughs> Nessie is, I guess. Now you can see what my basement looks like. Be Nessie. <laughs> all right. Well, th thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, guests, for joining us and sharing all of your expertise and putting time into presentations. I know it's a lot of work, so we really appreciate it. Um, thank you to our audience for uh, joining in and making such a lively uh, discussion via the chat box. And thank you, uh, Brian and Emily, for doing this with me. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks for including me. Yeah, it was great. I'm going to leave the I'm, gonna, I'm not going to shut it down immediately. If you guys want to pop off, go for it. But some people are having trouble finding the, the copy feature for the chat box. So oh. if you I'm just going to give a little bit more instruction. I don't know if it'll be helpful enough, but if, if you make the chat box, the full column on the side of the screen, like I have mine, um, directly next to the drop down where you select who you're chatting with, you should see three little dots. And that should allow you to copy the chat box. So I'll just wait to keep the meeting going for another minute to give everyone a chance to do their best to find that. And after that, you're, you're out of luck. Yeah, Travis, if you're still here, can you weigh in on whether or not you can see it? I know Mike wasn't sure last week if he could see it uh, when he wasn't a panelist. Yeah. Um, we could also, think, you know, we could, uh, I, if you, I don't know if you could link it, but you know, we, we could save it and just link it. In the, I did save it and we can link it. Um, and the, the only, uh, I, there, there are quite a few <laughs> here kind of hanging on at the end. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I can Matt, post it. You know what? I can post it with the, with the GBA uh, post that'll go up this weekend. So okay. if, uh, if you're not finding it, and it might be different on different devices, um, yeah, someone's saying that's... it's not there on an iPad. So, um, yeah. you know, it might be different with the apps or something. But... Yeah, I run a MacBook Pro and I can see it, but as a panelist, maybe I can see it and you can't see it normally. Um, no, so... I've been in the audience and have done it, so. Yeah, yeah so. it just depends. And okay, happy... well, this have a great night, everyone. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.